It's not a comfortable season. It's a season of, well, I hate to say the word transition because we've used that so often over the past few years in church, but actually he's creating that new wineskin, the ecclesia that is actually going to rule and reign with him in heaven. But I'm telling you that unless it's birthed in love, unless it comes from the love of the Father, unless what we do, what we say, how we live is birthed in love, we miss the very foundation of everything. It has to be love, not like, not I wish them the best. But when we talk about love, it's the sacrificial love of the Father where he says, if I'm calling you at 2 in the morning to get up and pray, get up and pray at 2 in the morning because that's what love does. Love is for the highest and for the best. You know, we, love is the highest and the best. It's not that wishy-washy emotion. It is a decision that what we are after is to release the love of the Father. And as we release the love of the Father, we release the highest and the best that he has planned and purpose for people around us, for ourselves. It is all about love because he is love. And if we do anything that is not in love, guess what? It's not in God. Regardless of how great our intentions are, regardless of how much we want it to be, if it is not birthed in love, if we don't carry the love of the Father, the love of Jesus, the love of the Holy Ghost, it is pointless because it's just going to be burnt up. And it's just going to become wood, straw, stubble, ash. Whereas he's called us to produce fruit. And we're moving into the ecclesia, the one that truly rules and reigns with Christ. And in doing that, there is a transgression, a trans, I said transgression, but there is a, a move from church to ecclesia. When we move into ecclesia, it is not about man. It is not about programs. It is not about plans. It's not about what we think. It is not about how we assume it's going to become. It is simply got to come, God, whatever your will is, let it be. We surrender to the will of God. We surrender to your will, your plan, your purpose. We surrender to you. And so we step into that. And so it comes from being birthed in love. But that new wineskin that he's moving us into, that's not always, a diff that's not always easy. Because we're comfortable in the old. We're comfortable with the old wineskin. We're comfortable, we're happy with the old wine. We know how it tastes. We know how to flow with it. We know how to come under the intoxication of it. We understand. We know. But he's saying, ah, not in this season. There's a new wineskin. And so that means that, and we're the wineskin, skin, wine, filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm the wineskin. So he's saying, you know, some of you need to be just immersed in the washing of the water of the word. Just washed in the washing of the water of the word. Others, you need to know a little bit of salt. That he's allowed us to get away with some stuff in the past. He's allowed us to kind of have a foot in both camps for a while. Because his grace is so amazing. And he's waiting for us to make a decision. But if you want to be a part of the ecclesia and move into what God is doing, we have to be holy for God. And I know it's easy to think, yeah, but I am. I'm on fire for God and I love God and I do whatever he wants. Let me tell you, no one here in this room has it together. Let me put my hand up first and foremost. I do not have my act together. I'm under construction just like everybody else. Every day he's challenging me about an attitude, something that's not right, something that I've, I've said or thought, something it, all the time. I'm, he's conforming me to the image of Christ just like he's conforming all of us. And we can no longer be comfortable where we are because it's not Christ that we're releasing upon society. It's a mix. And when something's a mix, it doesn't release anything much at all because one out, out sort of does the other. So, you know, some of us need to be just immersed in the washing of the water of the word. Others of us need a little bit of salt to get rid of the leaven. Others, you just need to be rubbed with oil. Like, goodness me, so inflexible, so rigid, so set in your ways. 
that you just need a good dose of the Holy Ghost. Just need a good dose of him. The Holy Spirit. Some of us are inflexible. Rigid. Oh, we'll make a move, but we'll only make a move when we're thoroughly convinced and we definitely know that it aligns with what we believe is right. Mm. Mm. And that's not the Holy Spirit. And, you know, when Jesus was rushed out into the, um, what do you call it, into the desert, he was driven by the Holy Spirit. To be tested by the devil. So, you know, expect the Holy Spirit to put you in some places that are not comfortable, that you really don't like, that it's not what you expect the Holy Spirit to lead you into, but they are tests for the spirit, the soul and the body so that you can be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, so that you can see what God wants from you. And I'm telling you right now, this is not a time anymore where we can soft soap the gospel. You either live for Jesus Christ or you don't. There's no in-between. Now, I understand growing in Christ. I understand that it's a process. I understand that there are, as, as I'm growing in faith, as I'm growing in revelation, it's not, I'm not automatically. But I'm saying right now that there is a stripping away of anything that we are depending upon for ourselves. Well, this is the way it is. This is the way I think. It's got to make sense to me. It's got to line up to this. That is being stripped away so that the only thing that is left is the truth and the power of God and his word. Yes, come on. And I've said this before and I'll say it again because I really want you to get a revelation of this. I feel like I'm on holy ground. I had to take the other shoe off. <laughs> In Hebrew, the three letters that make up truth is the first, the middle, and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Truth. Beginning, middle, end. Truth. Aleph Toph is the first one talking about God. But if you take the Hebrew letter of God out of the word truth, do you know what the two letters left to spell? Death. So anytime we agree to a truth that is not birthed in God, the result is death. Death of finances, death of opportunity, death of advancement, death of closed doors, whatever it might be, death of relationship. So you take God out of truth and all that's left is death. So we're in a nation that has taken God out of truth. We're in a nation that has taken God out of marriage. We've taken God out of, pre out of babies, looking after the young, the, the, the babies. We've taken God out of education. We've taken God out of the media. And what is left in our nation is a spirit of death that is continuing to grow and to prevail until the ecclesia stands up and says, I rebuke the spirit of death and I am releasing the spirit of life. I'm releasing truth. I will not accept this. This is wrong. I will speak truth. This is a time for you to stand up, show up and speak up. And health care. Yeah, like if you're depressed, you've got two choices. You can go to, what is it, the blue? If you're depressed, there's blue care, blue care or what, whatever it is. There's a thing if you're depressed. Oh, hey, if that doesn't work, we've got euthanasia. Like seriously. We can no longer come to church and think that this is acceptable in our nation. Come on. We can no longer come to meetings and think this is okay because it is not. Think of the children. Yeah. Yeah. Think of the generations. What are we leaving to them? This is a time when we take our place in the army of God and allow him to position us where he wants us. It says in Matthew chapter 13, around about verse 39, I think, let me just find it, Matthew 13, because it talks about Jesus sowing seed. The thing with seed, 36. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus answered, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed means the sons of the kingdom, the darn all are the sons of the evil one. The thing with seed is you have no say over where you are sown. In a vegetable patch, you're planted wherever. When Jesus sows you into the world to bring about transformation, to bring about redemption, you really have no say over where he plants you. And to think that we have the temerity to stand before the King of Kings and say, I will only go here or I will only serve you there. That's pride. He paid for us. He redeemed us. He owns us and he's given us the freedom to live as his sons and as his daughters, but we have no say over where he, he puts us. We have no say over our assignment because that was um, founded for us before the beginning of the world. And this is a season of intense agreement with the will and the word of God for our lives. Violent involvement in what God is doing. A violent involvement. So he's forming us into this, this new wineskin to hold this new wine. And you know that I've been studying the Holy Spirit now for over two years. And I have over 25,000 prayers and confessions of the Holy Spirit. And I feel like I haven't even touched the surface. Five handwritten books almost up to number six. The Holy Spirit is the most amazing, wonderful person. Jesus said it's much better for us that he went back to the Father so we could have the Holy Spirit. So let me tell you how the current church dishonors. This is nowhere on this, right? But let me tell you where the current church dishonors God. We dishonor the Holy Spirit. Because we think it's wonderful when the Holy Spirit moves and people are on the floor and the gifts flow. But we don't live with the Holy Spirit. We don't live with him. We just expect him to move. We dishonour the Holy Spirit. It's not blasphemy. He forgives us. This is not the unforgivable sin. But we dishonour the Holy Spirit every time we get so excited about a move of God and we keep it for Sundays or for special meetings or for conferences or whenever it might be or what we love to see on the TV, on the, on the YouTubes and the podcasts, but we don't live with him. Yeah. This is a season of fasting and intercession. You want to know why some devils aren't leaving? Because we have not embraced fasting and prayer. Let me tell you another way we dishonour the kingdom. We dishonour the sacrifices and the offices of Jesus Christ. Now we, we put the name of Jesus at the end of every prayer. We make declarations in the name of Jesus but we don't understand that it comes from an office, that he is my high priest. And as such, he takes my words and he takes my prayers and he makes them acceptable before he presents them to the Father. We don't honour him as the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies. We don't honour him as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Be healed in Jesus' name, we say but we don't honour his office. And as we don't honour his office, we wonder why things aren't manifesting in our lives the way the Bible tells us, because we just tack on the name of Jesus. But we have forgotten his office. I have over 280 names for the Holy Spirit. Pretty much the same for Jesus. We need to understand who we actually serve. Yes. Oh. He is the King of Kings. We are the Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. We are 
the Lord's, small L, small K. But he's also master. He's saviour, redeemer, deliverer, <laughs> baptizer. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of war. When was the last time you aligned with the Holy Spirit as the spirit of war to war against the spirit of evil in this nation? We have neglected the reality and the majesty of the kingdom for what we've been taught. This is what it is we've been told. Just say the name of Jesus at the end of your prayers. But really that only works if the prayer is in alignment with the will of God. And the nature of Christ. We have to come into a relationship with Father, Son and Holy Spirit in a way we never have before. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit spoke to the church. Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, separate these two for me and commission them. When was the last time you heard the voice of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever heard the voice of the Holy Spirit? Do you recognize the voice of Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit? Or have we all just lumped them together? And the Lord said, we are in the Western nation an impoverished church. We think we've got the answers. We think it's all intellectual. We think we've got everything. We've got nothing. If you have not got the presence of the King of Kings in your heart and in your life, if you don't serve him with everything you are, then let me tell you there is a process that we need to step into. And I'm not speaking condemnation because Jesus Christ has made us complete. When in the spiritual realm, in the Father's eyes, I am complete in Jesus Christ. In the natural, I've got some growing up to do. In the Father's eyes, when I put on the, the armour of God, the enemy sees me as God because I have on his armour. The only way the enemy knows it's me if I say something stupid. Step out from behind the armour. You've got to realise how, what God sees, how God sees you in the spirit realm and where he's growing us into. Any cracks in our relationships, any cracks in our marriages, any cracks anywhere, if they are not fixed, you are taking a faulty foundation into your kingdom walk, which will cause some kind of a time bomb sometime down the track later on. Just like when Abraham sold his wife to Pharaoh the first time in Genesis 12. And when Pharaoh found out what he'd done, Pharaoh said, oh my goodness, I'm not having a bar of this. I'm releasing you. I'm giving you silver and gold and main servants and female servants. In with those servants was a time bomb named Hagar who produced Ishmael. So every time we allow something to continue in our life that is not of God, we can carry a time bomb. Yes, time bomb repeats, generational. The first time Lot talked about, Abraham and Lot talked about strife in Genesis 13, the first, words, first time strife is used, it was a male word. In the Hebrew language it was male, which means it's a one-off argument, it just, it's just a one-off, we will deal with this and move on. But when Abraham talked about strife the second time that word is used in the following verse, it was a female 
word, female noun, which meant this is an ongoing thing. This will breed for generations. So you need to understand what's happening in the spirit realm by the decisions and the choices you make. So we've had this conference with David McDonald and he's talking about an equipped church and he's talking about the leaven that we carry on the inside of us which sometimes stops us from moving into the fullness. But I'm saying to you right now that in this new move of God, unless we are birthed in love and bathed in love, we will not, we will not walk in the fullness of the, what the Father has for us. Unless we're on that narrow path, we're not going to come out into that place of fruitfulness and lavish abundance that he's got for us. I'm not going to have much fruit to take to the Father. I might have a bit. This is a season of radical change. And if you are uncomfortable with radical change, just get in line with the rest of us because none of us are comfortable, right? None of us are comfortable with it. But we want it. We welcome it. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, this is something else that we need to get an understanding of. Otherwise, we're not going to be moving in the fullness of what he's got. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. So we're supposed to set forth his wonderful deeds and virtues through our lives. Yeah. But we have to understand that in order for that to take place, you are a chosen race. So if you ask me what my race is, what would it be? Yeah, but in, in the natural? Caucasian? Australian? Irish, yeah. A race. The only race I am is a kingdom race. This is where you're going to have to strip yourselves of anything that you feel describes who you are. Like Paul said, everything that I thought was worthy is really nothing but I'm going to consider it dung. So the race you are is a kingdom race. It says that you are a holy nation. A holy nation. What nationality are you? Kingdom. I am no longer an Australian citizen. I am here because my father gave me a visa from heaven to be born here and to do a work here in this nation. But in reality, if you want to know where I'm truly from, I'm a citizen of heaven. That's who I am. And my first loyalty, my first responsibility is to heaven. I cannot agree with governmental legislation that legislates sin cannot agree with it and the simple fact that some of my tax money goes to pay for pride marches euthanasia abortions we have to say in the realm of the spirit father god in the name of jesus we divorce ourselves from ungodly legislation in this nation we divorce ourselves from it and we ask that there would be a separation over our finances that our finances would not be used to fund evil in this nation however you do it however you do it in fact those that are, are perpetrating evil and wickedness in the nation, force them to their knees at the foot of the cross or get them out of the way so that righteousness can prevail. So your race is now God's race. You're children of God. You're a holy nation. You come from the kingdom and you're a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. As a king, you go to war. As a king, you make decrees. As a king, you rule and reign in life. But as a priest, you minister unto him. You worship at his feet. You pray for other people. You intercede for them. You need to know when you're, minister you're ministering as a, a priest and when you are ministering as a king. But I'm telling you right now that there is a lot of change that has to happen within us. We want the new wine. We want to be the new wineskin. I want to be on the very forefront of what God's doing. That's what I want. But I'm happy for him to position me any place he wants. 
So as David McDonald preached last week, and again this week I'm bringing it to you, allow the Holy Spirit to bring to light any leaven in your life that needs to be gone. Yes. Whatever it is. I remember um, a, a young couple um, that beautiful story, young couple, really wanted to get their life right with God, uh, married. But she'd come from a single parent family and he'd come from a family where the wife wore the, wore the pants. And so she ran the household. And the church they were going to at the time, the church I was at, said to them, you're out of order and you need to come into order. We are all out of order in some way. If you think you're not out of order, whether it's financially, whether it's relationally, whether it's at work, whatever it is, you are being deceived. And this is where the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth needs to come in and needs to show us where we are wrong. And he will give us Christ's grace to change. Anyway, the pastor sat down with the, 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 the couple and said to them, you're out of order. The man is the priest of the home. He can be saying things like, you're out of order. The tithe belongs to God. You're out of order. You're holding on to unforgiveness, bitterness, or whatever. There's different scenarios for different things. And they really wanted to change. It was, it was wonderful to see what God did. It was not an easy, pain-free transition because it was long-held beliefs and long-held habits that they had. But when I would ask her for a cup, you know, hey, do you want to come out for a cup of coffee? She said, oh, yes, I'd love to. And she said, oh, no, wait a minute. I just need to check with my husband. And so that was her way of changing and to bring our order in. But there's order missing in every area of our lives. Come on. If you think you've got your life in perfect order, let me introduce you to Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, and they will show you that there are areas in your life that needs to change. We have not got order. It doesn't matter how holy we think we are. It doesn't matter how righteous we think we are. It doesn't matter how well we think we've got our life together. Let me tell you right now, there is no one in this room that has their life without an area of disorder because otherwise you wouldn't be here. You'd be there. So it's a simple thing to say, Holy Spirit, where am I not in order with the kingdom? And show me how to change. It could be financial, that's usually the big one, or it could be health. Um, the body of Christ is besieged with financial and health disorders. And, we, and yet we believe that by the stripes of Jesus Christ we are healed. We believe we have the right to divine health. We believe that Jesus took our poverty at the cross and gave us his prosperity, but those two areas plague the body of Christ. So surely that is saying to us that somewhere we have not got the revelation we need to have. New wineskin is not going to be that comfortable to allow God to do. But it's what we all want. Yes. It's what we all want. Yes. I want Christ to be fully formed in me. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I have a, an issue in my family where some of the relationships between one of my, my children and the rest of us is very strained. It's really horrible. And I used to get really hurt every time I see something on Facebook or I see something happen. I would really feel the pain of a disjointed family. And you know, um, it just, it just, it just hurt. It was just, just hurt. <clears throat> and then I was thinking about saying, God, I don't want to live with this perpetual pain, and I don't want to live with this feeling that my family is so disjointed. I'm, I'm believing that, I've prayed that you would heal it and I'm believing you are healing it. But I don't know how to stop the pain. 
And he said to me, well, careful how I phrase this in case it's seen. Um, So-and-so has the gift of a pastor on their life. They're not pastoral, but, you know, they've got a gift of, they've got that loving pastoral gift. See that as a redemptive point in your family, that they married into your family to release a redemptive pastoral compassion upon your family. It's just that they're not yet in that position. So now it's like, oh God, I just really want to thank you that so-and-so carries such a pastoral gift and that you've brought her as a redemptive um, person, member of our family, and that when she's properly positioned, then things are going to be amazing. My last name, Torty, which is my married name, which is sometimes you might need to think about these things, but my last name, Torty, actually means twisted, lame, and torturous. How's that for a last name? Wow. Right? Praise God for Smith and Jones, yeah? But that's what it means. And I kept that name because I had six small children and they, would, they had their father's surname. And if I went back to my maiden name, it would just be confusion. You know, they were six and under. How do you explain, well, you've got that surname, but mummy's name is this one? So I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll just annoy my ex-husband and keep the name. <laughs> but when I found out it meant, oh, my gosh, twisted and torturous and lame, my goodness me. So I prayed about it. I said, Lord, I just want to thank you that I am the redemptive yeah. connection to take that curse off that name and to release the blessing of God throughout the family. Yeah. I am that redemptive connection. I am that one that can, that can change that. And so we've got to understand that there are places where you've got to see yourself as the redemptive connection with the kingdom of God, that you will release the blessing of God upon those things. Good. Love you. So we're in a... We're in a place where the father is wanting to get the family in line, get his house in order. So we need to listen for the voice of the father. We need to understand that our king, Jesus, is not just a friend, but he is our king. Lord, Saviour, Deliverer. So we've got to understand that Jesus is more than our, our friend, more than our Saviour. He is our Lord. He is our Deliverer. He's our Baptizer. He is our High Priest. He is our Shepherd. He is the anchor for our soul. He is the Rose of, of, the, of Sharon. He's the Lily of the Valley. He is the Son of the Most High. He is the Son of Man and the Son of God. He's the Wonderful Counselor. On His shoulders, the, government, the, the, the authority of the government reigns. And his government is an ever-increasing government. But we have to understand his authority. When do you come before him as the Lord of hosts? When you have financial difficulties, that's when you come before him as the Lord of hosts. Because it says three times in Malachi, when it talks about the tithe and the finances, when it talks in James, when it talks about money that's being withheld from you, it is the Lord of hosts. And we go to the Father and say, Father, I need this. Well, Father, we do. But I need the office of the Lord Jesus Christ. I need his office as the Lord of hosts when I have a financial need. I need his office as my shepherd when I have an area of my soul that needs restoration. We need to understand the different offices of Jesus Christ and honour them so that we actually become truly functional citizens of the kingdom of God and we need to understand the power the authority the presence of the Holy Spirit he is in every book of the Bible he wrote the Bible and even when the Holy Spirit is not mentioned by name there is a symbol of him oil wine uh, fire cloud, whatever it might be, light. He's in there. The Holy Spirit is amazing. If you want a copy of the 268 names of the Holy Spirit that I've got, just ask me for them. I'll send them to you. And I've got more coming. But you know what? We need to understand what we actually are serving in the kingdom of God. What we've done is we've taken our Australian citizenship and what it means to be an Australian citizen. And we said, well, now I'm a kingdom citizen. And it runs pretty much the way Australia does. 
It does not. And there are covenant guardians, threshold guardians, that every time we enter something new, there is a threshold covenant guardian, whether it's angelic or demonic. What we carry in our heart determines what is released. There's stuff that we need to know that we don't know that is causing us to fall, you know, to, to miss the fullness of what he's got for us. But the love of God is such that he wants every one of you set up, set straight and moving forward to take hold of the destiny he's got for you. He wants you to know the truth so that you can move in the truth and take the truth with you to other nations, to other countries, to other places, to other families, to other, other situations. You, we need to go. And I don't care if you go to the corner shop and release the gospel there. As long as you go and take the truth. So anytime I'm in a situation that looks pretty bad, Jesus, save me. You're my savior. Save me. But we need to know who, who we actually serve. And the father is setting his house in order. He's bringing his family into line. Thank you, God. Thank you, so spiritually, you are like fully equipped, complete in Christ. You've got everything for life and godliness. You've got everything. It's just we've got these few cracks in our soul where our thinking is not aligned with the truth of the word. Where we sometimes think, that my opinion is greater than God's. Well, yes, God, I accept that you've forgiven me, but I can't quite forgive myself for what I did. That is idolatry of self. And we have placed our judgment upon that situation above God's. Come on, guys, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. We've got a nation at stake. We've got a younger generation that's growing up that doesn't even know there are Ten Commandments. Does not even know. And the world will not walk in the fear of God until we do. When we walk in the fear of God, it will overshadow the world. But if we're not walking in it, it won't touch the world. It's time for change. It's time for change. And as the Holy Spirit told Praying Hyde, I do not want you to say one thing about that man because I love him. And we are too quick to say other things about other people that are not a blessing, that are a judgment, they're an accusation. They're a put down. I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. But praying high, started to pray about this man in India and he said, God, because this man was not a good man and he was a pastor. And so praying high was going to go to town and say, God, you know, this man, this pastor. And before he could get anything out, the Spirit of God shushed him and said, don't you say one word about someone I love. Wow. And he said, well, what, how do I pray? And he said, thank me for the good you see in them. Well, it took him two weeks, but he found he was good to animals. <laughs> so he started thanking God that he was good to animals. And you know, within two weeks, that bad man, his church had revival because of the power of the blessing. Because of the power of the blessing. Anytime we allow blessing and cursing out of our mouths, we're a mixed well, there's leaven right there. The power of the blessing. Wow. So anytime we think things like, but I've always done it this way, I can't do that. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I don't have time. I'm not creative. Any time we have any negative thought, you cannot allow the luxury of a single negative thought. It is a luxury that you cannot allow because it does not come from God. 
Your father is the most encouraging, loving, wonderful, just wanting to see you fulfill destiny, reach your full potential, go to the nations and go everywhere he's called you to go. He wants that more than you do. So you can't allow the luxury of a single negative thought. I need the Holy Spirit to help me block them. So we need to grow up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God for Christ. Thank you that he died for us. Thank you that he took our place. Thank you that the sin nature died within us. Thank you that he gave us his victory. He gave us his life, his victory, his righteousness, his wisdom, his sanctification. He gave everything, an abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness. He gave it all to us as a marvellous gift and all we have to do is receive. We don't have to achieve anything. We don't have to try and be anything. We just have to say, thank you, Father. I receive the finished work of Jesus Christ. I receive the finished work of Jesus Christ and I give you all the glory. Amen.